Most millionaires make their money without a trust fund or inheritance. Most millionaires aren't born, they're self-made. There was a survey by a company called Fidelity and Investments. It said 80% of people who have a net worth of over a million dollars did it without a trust fund or inheritance. The, uh, there was a, about 40 years ago, there was some of you may remember uh, the Smith Barney television commercial would say, they make money, uh, Smith Barney, they make money the old-fashioned way. They earn it. Well, there's also millionaires, self-made millionaires, have certain habits that have helped them to accumulate wealth. There's an online magazine article entitled The Habits of Seven Made Millionaires by Stephanie Vaza. And she's quoting an author who's uh, with a soon-coming book called The Author of Rich Habits, Tom Corley. And she says, your habits are the reasons that you're rich or poor. It's often that only two or three habits separate the wealthy from those who are financially challenged. Well, this particular author, Mr. Corley, has studied millionaires for many years and said many of them share the same daily practices and beliefs. Well, today I want to examine the practices or habits of self-made millionaires and see how these same habits or practices are parallel to what God would have us do to become effective Christians. So the title for today is Habits of Self-Made Millionaires, Part 1. This message is not a nod to those but that to the trend by some people who want a prosperity gospel, but rather it's an exploration and discovery of how we're to succeed and what we can do with what we are given. So what is that first characteristic that this author came up with after years of study? He came up with number one, self-made millionaires read. They're readers. The, they said this is the number one habit that you want to adopt if you, become, if you want to become wealthy. According to his study, 85% of millionaires read two or more books a month. And they chose books to help them to grow including topics like careers, biographies of successful people, self-help or health, current events, psychology, and leadership. He goes on to say the key to success in life is growing your knowledge base and skills. Devote 30 minutes or more each day to learning by reading books. And if you do, it'll set you apart from the competition because most people do not read. So all self-made millionaires have to start somewhere. And much of their habits that they have done can be attributed, how they make their seven-figure status, their million-dollar status, can, can be attributed to, to what we would call, what they call rich habits. There's, a, <clears throat> there's a, uh, the habits that they're looking at can, are the cause of wealth, poverty, happiness, sadness, stress, good relations, bad relations, good health, or bad health. The author goes on to note that the good news is that habits can be changed. There's a related article in Business Insider, uh, an online uh, magazine, that he also continues to discuss these habits of what these millionaires, self-made millionaires, do. And he goes on to say they don't just read, they read consistently. The rich would rather be educated rather than entertained. And he goes on to, again, say that, you, that 30 minutes or more each day on self-education or self-improvement. And most re read to require or maintain knowledge, not just for entertainment. He categorized reading into three categories. Biographies of successful people, self-help, and history. Another component of the reading was not just reading consistently, but consistently meaning every day. Among the wealthy people, reading 30 or more minutes a day... <clears throat> They made good use of their reading time. 63% listened to audiobooks uh, while they're during their commute. They plug something into the car, into the car uh, uh, DVD player or CD player. 79% read educational or career-related material. 55% for personal development. 58% read biographies of successful people. 94% read current events, staying on top of things. 51% read about history. And one out of nine or 11% read purely for entertainment purposes. So 
If you take a look at what separates these people from everyone else, by increasing their knowledge, they're able to see opportunities, which then translates ultimately into what you can measure in their world, which is money. Compare them then to the one in 50 who are struggling financially and <clears throat> uh, severe uh, financial struggles and are don't growing, uh, who aren't growing uh, um, personally and professionally is the ones that just don't read at all. Well, then the question is, <clears throat> What does it take to be a self-made millionaire Christian? One who is rich in biblical knowledge and understanding of the ways of God. We know what it takes. If we're going to be a self-made millionaire in this world, the first category would be uh, in reading. And so <clears throat> how does that apply to the would-be spiritually rich Christian? Well, when our boy was about seven or eight years old, he played his first Monopoly game, a board game with us. And unlike most people, he actually read the rules before the game. We were well into the game, and I made a play on the board, and he says, Aha! The rule says on the bottom of page three, you can't do that. Whoa. So I look it up, and sure enough, it was there. At the bottom of rule, page, rule, bottom of page three. At an early age, you understood that if you knew the rules, you'd be well positioned to be successful. And just like knowing the rules of Monopoly, we can know the rules of the game for a happy life, well, we read the rules, which is the Bible. There's an interesting article on ucg.org. Uh, well, I'll get to that one in a minute. Um, at first, I went online, and I just typed in, why should we read the Bible? Right? See what somebody else has to say. Typed it in, and what did we come up with? And the answer was really quite short. and was rather interesting, and I thought on point. And the answer I came up with under God Questions... <laughs> Dot org. I'm not in, neither endorsing or uh, uh, that site. It just happened to have an interesting answer. We should read and study the Bible because it's God's word to us. The Bible is literally God breathed, as it's interpreted in 2 Timothy 3:16. Well, I'm going to take a look at 2 Timothy and I'm going to look at verses 15 through 17. So in 2 Timothy uh, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 15, starting there, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. Now, find following up on verse 17. This is often uh, not quoted, but let's follow it up. It says that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Sounds like it's preparation, just like the self-made millionaires. They were preparing for what opportunities would arise, what they could do better to take advantage of those opportunities. And here we say, what is the purpose for our reading, for our studying? Because the scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for all these reasons that we might be prepared or thoroughly equipped for every good work. <clears throat> Acts 17 and verse 11 we can follow this up, and it's a discussion here uh, where Paul was traveling from one city to another after being kicked out of one city or run off, and he wrote about those in Thessalonica in Acts 17, verse 11, uh, as compared to the Bereans. And those were more fair-minded, the Bereans, than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness. The Bereans had listening ears. They were ready to understand. But did they take everything he said just because he said so? Second half of the verse, and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They read the scriptures. They read them consistently. Just like the millionaires that we read about that were reading consistently, they were reading the Bible consistently. Now, if we go back there in, uh, in, uh, in verse 16, where we read in the New King James, all scriptures given by inspiration of God, other translations would say the words are God-breathed. In other words, just by the breath of God, these words come out of the Bible. Those are the words that God has given to us. Well, what are these words that God gives us good for? Well, God gives us the answers to a lot of things in Scripture. What's the purpose of life? Where did I come from? Is there life after death? How do I get on the path to the kingdom of God? Why is the world full of evil? Why do I struggle to do good? In addition to the big questions, the Bible gives us a lot of practical advice in areas such as, what do I look for in a mate? 
How can I have a successful marriage? How can I be a good friend? How can I be a good parent? What is success and how do I achieve it? How can I change? What really matters in life? How can I live so that I don't look back with regret? How can I handle the unfair circumstances and bad events of life victoriously? Of course, we should read the Bible because it's reliable and without error. And it doesn't just say, read me and trust me, because we have the ability to test what it says in the Bible. We can check hundreds of prophecies and see that it makes and check them against historical records and by checking the scientific data that comes up. And those who say the Bible have errors then have their ears closed to the truth. The, we should read the Bible because God doesn't change and because mankind's nature, unfortunately, also isn't changing. So it's important for us, irrelevant, uh, when it was written, that even though technology changes, mankind's nature is still that way, the, the way it is, and his desires are still there. So every generation has to take a look at it anew and resolve the issues for themselves. Um, <clears throat> In Ecclesiastes 1.9, I'm just going to refer to there's nothing new under the sun. And so each generation seems to have to learn that all over again. So we read the Bible in pages of history. And we can look at what has happened to others. And they each discover this for themselves. We have uh, the, as the, in the secular world, people live, of course, uh, we would say uh, their definition of the bread of life is a little different than what Jesus Christ said is the definition of bread of life. If we take a look at Matthew 4.4, 4, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's a pretty important book. When, you, when this God-breathed book is delivered to us, we all have a copy uh, that's right there. It's available to us, unlike much of history. And if we want to live then the life that to the fullest as God intended, then we have to actually read and then heed that particular book. Of course, when we read this Bible, uh, uh, the Holy Scriptures, there seems to be a lot of false teaching about it. Well, the Bible can give us measuring sticks by which we can measure the truth from the air. And so, uh, and so if we follow those, and I know we've discussed before the rules of biblical interpretation and so forth, how to read the Bible is really another entire message. But as long as we're reading the Bible and we have value in that, along this line, God's word shows us how much God loves us. And of course, commonly it's John 3, 16. God loves us how much? It so loved the world that he gave his only son uh, for us, that he might die, that we might live. And so, so God loves us and he loves, uh, and he is also using this tool to equip us in order to serve him. We went just went over Second Timothy three, fifteen, actually three seventeen, um, and the purpose for equipping us is to save us from ourselves, save us from sin, and then the consequences of that sin. And of course, going along with that, if we read God's word, it helps us to see what sin is like in our lives and gives us a, an opportunity to get rid of it. So we don't waste our time on things that don't matter and that won't last. That's in Matthew 7. We can look at Matthew uh, verses 24 through 27. I've got a lot of verses. I can't read them all. But I can refer to some. When we read and study the Bible, we can see beyond the attractive bait or the, that's a painful hook and sinful temptations. Now we see this all over. The temptations are, are everywhere. And we can see the bait and we can determine what is bait and, and give us a better opportunity. And, we, and one way to do that is to learn from other people's mistakes rather than, we, rather than making them ourselves. We simply cannot live long enough to make all of those mistakes ourselves. So it's, we have an opportunity to read the Bible and learn from the mistakes of others. Because experience is a great teacher. It's certainly very effective, but it's a terribly hard teacher as well. And then the Bible is full of, full of biblical characters that we can learn from. Some we can learn from in a very positive sense and others in a, our negative role models that we should avoid. David, when he was defeating Goliath, uh, uh, is, it's an inspiration of 
how he could have faith in God to work with him in order to defeat Goliath. Yet at the same time, we, it's also recorded about his weaknesses in life and the difficulties and long-lasting and terrible consequences of a moment's sinful pleasure. So this is very human, it's very realistic, and it gives us the upsides and the downsides, the upsides of following God and the downsides of, of uh, ignoring God from time to time. But it's not just a book. The Bible isn't just a book to read. It's a book to study. And the reason you study it is so it can be applied. So the Bible as God's word is just as binding as the laws of nature. We can't ignore gravity or we do so at our own peril. I learned that. I think I was uh, very severely about age 10. You cannot jump off the chicken barn roof without a nasty consequence. The ground is not as close as you think. Fortunately, I landed on softer soil. Had it been just three feet away, it had been a hard hard track. And I don't know what would have happened there, but I jumped down and bounced my head off the soil and uh, took all the wind out and said, I don't think I want to do that again. Um, <clears throat> well, we're approaching the end of the calendar year, and each year we have an opportunity to begin again and read the entire Bible in one year. And there are study groups online that we can join to encourage each other to read the Bible daily. The self-made millionaires of the secular world read biographies of successful people, self-help, or personal development in history. Well, what do we find when we open the Bible? We find biographies of successful people, we find self-help or personal development, and we find history. So what's the number one characteristic of a self-made millionaire? They read consistently. And a Christian millionaire who reads consistently can increase their understanding of God's word as they learn to follow God. Second characteristic that Mr. Corley found about self-made millionaires. They pursue things that interest them. Oh, that's a shock. They pursue things that interest them. People often enter careers for a stability factor, but... Wealthy people pursue their interests. Uh, they do what they love. Or as this author says, they put their ladder on their own wall. They decide what they're going to climb, what they're going to attack. When you're passionate about what you're doing, you work harder. Well, isn't that the truth? There's a book that's been rewritten uh, perhaps more than once by Paul Teeger and others. Do what you are. Discover the career for you through the secrets of personality type. And I've been reading that versions of that book for over 20 years. In other words, do what really makes you happy. This is the, what a secular uh, millionaire will do is what's their passion? What do they really want to do? What's, what's your drive in life? What's your motivation? And that's what they follow because what you're going to be motivated on is what you're going to do the most and work the hardest in. There's another one, and I do some career counseling uh, among students. This is an interesting book that you may have heard of, and it gets updated from time to time. What color is your parachute? Practical Manual for Job Hunters and Career Changers by Richard Bowles. And people explore how to, how to match their interests with what employment they want. What about a millionaire Christian? What's your true passion? We can open up to Mark 12 and verse 30. We can read the first commandment in Mark 12 and verse 30. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and, or with the mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Why would we do that? The answer is in 1 John 4.19. We love him because he first loved us. So loving God is absolutely critical, capturing the passion for that. Uh, there's an article on ucg.org under Bible study tools, under questions and answers. And the, the article, it's a short article, two-minute read, about how do you recapture your first love for God? Well, how do we recapture our first love for God? And Heather Disher writes uh, in this article about how Christ praised the church in Ephesus. We read this in uh, Revelation 2, verse 4 or Revelation 2, verses 1 through 4. And he praised the church in Ephesus for their works, for their labor, their patience, and their perseverance. And then in verse 4, he says this, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Ouch. In other words, they were doing things routinely, 
automatically just moving along, but they weren't doing it with passion. They weren't doing it was their first love. They had lost that. It kind of dissipated away. The uh, Jesus also warned about Christians in the end time because in Matthew 24, 12, we read, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will wax cold. Interesting, they use the term wax here. Uh, you know, when wax drips down the candle and it cools on its way down as it cools. And so our love, do we let it grow cold over time? So that's what Christ was referring to there. A new Christian, typically as she goes on, typically experiences first love for the truth. It's new. It's exciting. Uh, they eagerly study God's word. And in fact, it's, some, it's so exciting. Many of us will remember we would burn the midnight oil just in order to learn more. Christ said that the Ephesians had begun with an excitement and a love for the truth, but then other issues and spiritual battles eroded some of their enthusiasm. So what is in Revelation 2, 5, what did Christ say? Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. In other words, recover what you were doing earlier, what you had first turned your heart and your mind to uh, in, following, uh, in following the way of God. So there was a time, as I'd mentioned, when David found that he had drifted away from God. He didn't feel the joy that he had at, at one point. And then he turned around, he repented, and he prayed. And if we look in Psalm 51, 12, what did he say? Restore me to the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. David wanted to be reconciled to God. And he, and he wanted God to stir up the spirit so that he could serve him faithfully and zealously for the rest of his life. So if we're to return to a diligent study of the scripture and ask God, to restore a spiritual hunger inside of us. God will hear and he'll answer us. And then as we study, it'll be like God is speaking directly to us through those pages. <coughs> God wants us to continue to assemble and fellowship together in order to, as we read in Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. God wants us to assemble and fellowship considering that we should uh, 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 stir up one another to love and good works. So fellowshipping with our fellow Christians can help keep our love from growing cold. So what is our first passion? What do we want to do? We take a look at twelve, uh, Luke 12 and verse 34. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So so, or you might even flip it around. Where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. It works both ways. So what's the second point? Self-made millionaires, they pursue things that interest them. A Christian spiritual millionaire will recapture and maintain the true love then of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's point two. Point three, self-made millionaires find a mentor. Self-made millionaires find a mentor. 93% of self-made millionaires in the author Corley's study attributed their wealth to having a mentor. Finding, and he goes on to say, finding a success mentor in life is one of the least painful ways to become rich. It can put you on the fast track to success. And then he puts down five kinds of success mentors. And the first one he comes up with, this is in this for secular millionaires, he says is parents. Parenting is important when it comes to being a millionaire. Parents are your first mentors. If they teach the children good daily success habits, they will struggle less in life. More positive outcomes. Another mentor would be teachers. They can reinforce the mentoring that children receive at home from their parents or step in and provide the success mentoring if it's absent from the home. Thirdly, he says they're career mentors. He suggests people find a career mentor whom you admire or trust that can lead you to success and says you should choose someone at least two levels higher than you above your rank at your work. And then there's another kind of mentor he calls a book mentor. Mentors don't have to be real relationships. Sometimes the best sources are found in books, particularly books about successful people. 
So we can, of course, then read biographies. And then the last category he puts of mentors is yourself. It's also called the school of hard knocks. You can mentor yourself by learning from your own mistakes. He goes on to say this is a hard path to success because those mistakes and failures cause significant costs in both time and money. But it's also the most powerful kind of mentoring you can get because the lessons you learn are infused with intense emotions and never forgotten. Remember the time when, and then we can just click it off, off. And then there was the time thus and such happened. And then there was a time I jumped off the chicken barn roof when I was 10 years old, and somehow I'm still remembering that. And a whole lot of other things that I don't want to talk about right now. Well, who is your millionaire Christian success mentor? Well, let's go down his list. What about parents? When possible, we should look to our parents as our first Christian mentors. But before condemning our parents as being less than perfect, because they all were, let's ask ourselves, what kind of a parent do we make? Every generation can ask themselves if they can improve upon what came before them. As an adult and a parent, and now a grandparent, I look back and I marvel at how my parents managed to raise four boys born in five years to adulthood relatively unscathed. I stand in amazement that my parents were able to set a strong example and have high expectations of us. Yet it didn't always seem so at the time. But when it came time for me to be a parent, I developed a whole new appreciation for the challenges that they faced. It's a strong responsibility that church members, for all church members to be prepared to be stand-in parental mentors for those who need us. We must be there for those who need us, every one of us, because we all have something to share. There's also career mentors. Is there someone in the church you can talk to who can help to show you a better way? Maybe someone who has already experienced what you're going through. I remember changing jobs many years ago. There was a guy in the church where I was uh, moving to who had experience working for a similarly managed company with whom I was negotiating employment. His advice was enormously helpful and he positioned me well for success at that company. We have examples in the Bible of someone who is preparing themselves for the future for success in Acts 7.32. In Acts 7.32, we read about this fellow named Moses. And Moses was learned in all the wisdoms of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Moses didn't learn it alone. He learned it from the Egyptians. He took their own information, okay, and developed wisdom, the wisdom that he could, took all the wisdom that he could from it. In 2 Timothy 3.14, But you must continue in the things you've learned, as Paul wrote, and have been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them. In other words, pay attention to your mentor. Remember what you've learned and from whom you've learned them. So there are career mentors uh, in the Bible as well. And then there's book mentors. Just as self-made millionaires have book mentors, people whom they've read about and take lessons from, we have an entire Bible full of mentors from whom we can extract helpful observations. We read chapter 11 of Hebrews as quite an experience looking at the mentors through God's eyes. How did God see these people despite the challenges that they faced along the way? I'm going to turn to Hebrews 11 and just run through some of the names because these aren't all perfect people in Hebrews 11, and yet God holds them up as being faithful. And if we go to Hebrews 11, and we'll just jump right through it, um, in verse 4, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Verse 5, By faith Enoch was taken away and did not see death. Um, verse 7, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place to receive an inheritance. Verse 11, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed and bore a child at advanced age. And it shows the results of all of that. <clears throat> and we can continue to go down. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And and, and we move on, and, and we see, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob, 
By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph. By faith, Joseph, when he's dying, made mention of the departure of children of Israel. Verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden by his mother. And then when he was of age, became refused to be uh, called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And we keep going. And we just go through these examples. And we can read those examples throughout the Bible as book mentors for us. They're there. They're available for us as we go down the line. Um, <clears throat> by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. And it talks about Rahab having faith at that side. Uh, faith of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel. And, and then... It doesn't stop there. It doesn't. It just doesn't name them all. It refers to them. Uh, and the prophets. <laughs> There's a long list of those. And it shows what they did. So we have an enormous resource in learning about these book mentors. And then there's the ultimate mentor, Jesus Christ. In Matthew 19, verse 28 and verse 29 in Matthew 19. Jesus was speaking to Peter and the other disciples. And, and starting in, in Matthew 19, verse 28, and Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. There's the value there. There's the mentorship that Jesus Christ said. When you do this and you follow me, this is what's in your future. Of course, not everyone can uh, uh, understands that or sees that. Most of us have memorized John 6.44. And 645, no one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 45, and it's written in the prophets and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. <clears throat> Christ is a mentor for us in 1 Peter 2.21. For this you were called because Christ suffered for us, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. I remember doing that as a kid on the farm. My dad's feet were bigger than mine. So I could walk through the mud. And I could see the prints. That was kind of neat. Just kind of step on through it. Never thought I'd read a verse about it someday, about following in your father's footsteps. Um, back a chap or ahead a little bit in Second Peter one, sixteen. <clears throat> Following in Christ's footsteps means something positive and powerful. In Second Peter one, sixteen. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables, when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Today people call the Bible. Uh, cunningly devised fables. If you get this uh, Alexa, Amazon Alexa, where it answers questions for you now, that's all the rage, go ahead and ask them the question. And I saw this uh, video yesterday. Is Who is Jesus Christ? And what does Alexa respond? A fictional character from history. Okay? So we read here, the good, this is not, we're not following a fictional character from history, some fable somewhere, and yet Satan would have the world believe that. It's much more exhaustive and complimentary of Muhammad, by the way. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians 4.17, the Apostle Paul was a mentor to Timothy. And he writes, in 1 Corinthians 4.17, For this reason I've sent Timothy to you, writing to the people in Corinth, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. So he was the mentor as he, as, and he said, Timothy's going to remind you of how I teach and what I've done when I was there. But did Paul say it was just because of him and what he was doing? No. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, what does Paul say? Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. 
He wasn't saying, just follow me. It's only as I follow Christ. So we have book mentor uh, and the ultimate mentor <clears throat> is Jesus Christ. And of course, following the secular pattern of mentorship, uh, ourselves, do we learn from our own mistakes on our Christian journey? David wrote in Psalm 119, verse 71. In Psalm 119, verse 71, it is good for me that I've been afflicted. Now, how many of you have gotten up this morning and said, it's good for me that I've been afflicted? It's not what I thought of when I got up this morning. It wasn't yesterday. It wasn't the day before. And then I ran across this verse. And I said, well, I guess it is good for me that I've been afflicted. What's the last half of the verse? That I may learn your statutes. The law is there to teach us the right way to go. And if we vary from that, we bring those afflictions on ourselves. Do we learn from our own mistakes? Proverbs 1 and verse 5. Proverbs 1 and verse 5. Well, what does a wise man do? A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. <clears throat> so, yeah, if, we, if we're going to be wise, we're going to learn from our mistakes. And the last verse in this section is Proverbs 9.19. Not everybody listens to advice, even from themselves. In Proverbs, in fact, it reminds me of, and I may have told it before, about I'm 40 years old, helping my dad on the farm. We were putting up some fences and gates, and I had made some stupid mistake. And he pushes his hat back on his forehead, and he said, Son, I don't mind if you make a mistake now and again. I just wish you'd make different ones. Well... <clears throat> Let's go to Proverbs 9.19. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase by learning. So let's learn then from our own mistakes. So what is the, the rule number three of a self-made millionaire? Find a mentor. Rule number three for a Christian millionaire, same thing. Find and follow mentors. Characteristic number four. Characteristic number four, self-made millionaires use dreams to set goals. Well, this is interesting. Before millionaires identify their goals, they do something called dream setting. They write down what their ideal life would look like. And then they create a kind of a script and they use a script to make a bullet point of what they really want to do. What are their dreams? Then they build goals around you know, their dreams. As the author writes, they think of dreams as a ladder and then the rungs on that ladder are their goals. And then they ask, what would I need to do for each wish or dream to come true? Am I capable of performing these activities? Do I have the necessary skills and knowledge? And then take action. I'm reminded of a tape I heard, this was 20 plus years ago, about the late Zig Ziglar, who was a motivational speaker who summed up goal setting like this. We have a vision and our vision directs our goals. Our goals direct our long-term objectives. Our long-term objectives uh, establish what our short-term objectives are. Our short-term objectives direct our daily strategies, and our daily lives are then are composed of those strategies that we use to achieve all of the short-term, long-term uh, goals so that the final result is we achieve a vision. They get somewhere. Well, what about a millionaire Christian? How do they use their dreams to set up goals? Well, the church has a vision statement based upon the mission that Jesus Christ has set forth for us. It's online. You can look at uh, ucg.org. Uh, uh, Darius McNeely has an interesting write-up on what is our vision. And he quotes it simply. The vision of the United Church of God is a church led by God's Holy Spirit, joined and knit together by what every member supplies, with all doing their share and growing in love to fulfill God's great purpose for humanity and bring many children to glory. And it refers to two verses, Ephesians 4.16 and Hebrews 2.10. So I'm going to read just those two verses in Ephesians 4.16. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth for, of the body for the edifying of itself in love. All bonding, bonding together, working together. And in Hebrews 2.10. For it was fitting for him, for whom all things and by whom all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. 
bringing many sons to glory is the objective that God has for the church. And of course, it says, <clears throat> through sufferings, it made me think of 2 Peter 3, 9, that everybody goes through some measure of suffering. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering for us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, does our vision of Christianity line up with the vision that Christ has for the church? Well, I'm pleased that in this congregation, I see the heart and the strength and the courage and the commitment that does match that vision. And personally, it's a very warm feeling. Well, then does this Christian vision that we have help set up our personal goals? Our personal goals backed up with long-term and short-term objectives. Our daily lives driven by strategies to accomplish what God has in mind for us. Referring back to Zig Ziglar, he once noted that people who are working to achieve their goals are never really truly depressed. They may feel down from time to time, but their visions, goals, objectives, and strategies drive and build up their daily lives. So point four, what does a self-made millionaire do? They use dreams to set their goals. What does a Christian millionaire do? They adopt the vision of Jesus Christ and the mission that he has set forth for us. And the fifth category, I like this one. Self-made millionaires hang out with other successful people. The author writes in the study, you're only as successful of those who you frequently associate with. The rich are always on the lookout for people who are individuals who are goal-oriented, optimistic, enthusiastic, and have an overall positive mental outlook. Because negative and destructive criticism will derail you from pursuing success. Well, then the question then comes for the Christian millionaire. Hmm. What is, uh, what's a characteristic that fits? Well, do we fellowship with other Christians? Do we have the right kind of fellowship? And if we look in Acts 2, in verse 42, <clears throat> and what did the apostles do? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and prayers. We do that too. We get together and we share bread. We break bread together as it were, share a meal, and we get together and share our prayers and learn more about each other and encourage each other. Um, in Hebrews 10, verse 24, in Hebrews 10, verse 24, in this discussion of fellowship and bringing like-minded people together, let's consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. So it's important for us to assemble together to give us encouragement, just like those millionaires are in their secular world and they're joining their clubs and organizations and how they can encourage each other. So can we as millionaire Christians. But there's another avenue that we can follow or a similar related avenue so we can avoid the wrong kind of fellowship. In 2 Corinthians 6.14, Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? So we don't get together with that. First Thessalonians 5.22, just a few words in that verse. Abstain from every form of evil, or the appearance of evil is really what it's looking at. Just avoid all that. Now there's a benefit to good fellowship. And the benefit is really quite marvelous in 1 John 1, 7, last verse in this point. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let that sink in for a moment. If we're doing what God says, we're walking in the light, just as Christ is in the light, and then we fellowship together, all of us, trying to follow Christ, what happens? The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. That's pretty big. It's pretty big for all of us. So point five, the self-made millionaires hang out with other successful people. Christian millionaires fellowship with other Christians to build each other up, okay, to follow Jesus Christ. 
So what have we learned from these habits of self-made millionaires as they were from the secular world? What are they doing? They're reading, cons they're reading consistently. And what do Christian millionaires do? They read consistently to increase their understanding of God's word as they learn to follow God. Secondly, self-made millionaires follow their passions and they pursue things that interest them. Christian millionaires recapture and maintain the true love of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Point three, self-made millionaires find a mentor. Christian millionaires also find and follow mentors. And we have a lot of them that we can really focus on. Point four, self-made millionaires use dreams to set goals. Christian millionaires adopt the vision of Jesus Christ and the mission that, that he has set forth for us in the church. And point five, self-made millionaires hang out with other successful people. Christian millionaires fellowship with other Christians to build each other up. The common practices or habits of self-made millionaires in the secular world are remarkably the same as what the Bible displays. How those same habits and practices are parallel with what God would have us to do to become effective Christians. So let's use each day as an opportunity to respond to God's invitation to become spiritual millionaires in the kingdom of God.